I'll tell you something about myself, why I chose my higher education at Purdue University rather than any other school. We have some nice schools in Indiana, Butler is one of them, but my yearning was to go to Purdue for several reasons. It was a scientific institution, but it was also very much dedicated to the general education. I learned a lot about civics, English, and history at Purdue. And, and one of the values that I found going to Purdue is when I served in the United States military, destiny took me to Japan. And, and it's so interesting that a lot of Japanese citizens who just went through a war themselves they, they heard about Purdue, and, and, and they, I, I appreciate the fact they held Purdue in a very high esteem. And in many conversations with people, I have, so why do you pick, why do you go to Purdue versus other schools? Purdue is just, Rose home we have in Terre Haute, very, it's also a good technical school, but Purdue, when you travel the world for all the education, all the studies, you might as well go to a, a school that is recognized by people all over the world. It meant a lot to me. And of course, someone who likes basketball, P Purdue was in the Big Ten. And then at that time, there was no three-point shots, therefore we didn't have to dedicate ourselves to a part of the game in which we did not excel too much, if you know what I mean. Our offense, three-point offense didn't exist very well the last few years. So I'm very proud that I picked Purdue over other good schools in Indiana. And uh, the reason I picked pharmacy is when I came over as a boy, I worked, I worked for a family who owned a drugstore. I worked for them, and as a matter of fact, I lived in their house. They gave me a roof over my, over my head. And, and the reason I chose pharmacy, for example, is in a drugstore where I worked, we had a gentleman, his name was Dr. Colliers. We called him Doc. Actually, it was no Doc. He was also Colliers, C-O-L-I-E-R. -E but he gave, passed out so much advice to customers. Everybody called him Doc. And then I, uh, I also, at that time, played a little tennis. I wasn't, I wasn't very good, but I used to play at Ray Park tennis. And my tennis playing came from the fact that I was a very good, if I may say so, I was a very good ping pong player, table tennis player. And if I may interject something about table tennis, when I was liberated by the American Army, I was almost like adapted by an engineer combat battalion. And and one uh, and ping pong, it's a funny thing, it became a big vehicle for establishing friendship. For example, I remember there is a, uh, in every, shall we say, in every military unit, there is a recreation area, almost like, like a small gym and they had ping pong tables. And here I was, a little guy, came from the United States, a survivor of concentration camps, and I would play with a fellow GI who happens to be from Texas or Oklahoma, or Kansas, from the heartland of America, as they say. And, and, and ping pong, just as table tennis game, was a big vehicle establishing friendship. Now, when I started playing ping pong, 
when I was very young. We lived in a small apartment in Riga, Latvia. That was the place where I lived in Europe. Riga was the name of the city. Latvia was the country. I, I don't joke, look very much with much happiness to my years in Latvia because the people there were very anti-Semitic. They didn't like Jewish people, and I happened to be Jewish. I had a tough time in Latvia. But I remember we, had, uh, we lived in a small apartment. People in Europe, only the very rich people live in nice homes like we have here in this here in the States. Average people here you know, in America live like very rich people in Europe. It's about one, one good point to recognize. But we just lived in an apartment. And I remember we never had room for ping pong tables or recreation room tables. But I remember my mother would remove the tablecloths and, and no ping pong net or anything. A string and a newspaper became the net, and me and my little friends would play ping pong for years until we till I started when I was nine years old. And, and, and when I was 13, the Nazis came in, so for four or five years as a free young citizen, I remember I used to play ping pong all the time. But when I was kept liberated by the American army, there was a, you never, it's difficult to describe. The game of ping pong was a big vehicle in establishing friendship with my fellow GIs who were part of the unit which liberated me. I mean, you just wait. In the military, you just, it's a custom. You play, they, they, don't, they don't keep you on score, but you just keep on playing at a table until you finally get beat a set, two, two, two games. So I was pretty good. I was playing big guys from Texas and Oklahoma and Indiana, for some of the Hoosiers too. And just, I look back with a lot of pride. A game of ping pong moved to the American way more than anything else. It's difficult to describe. One of the most beautiful one of my, my beautiful experiences associated with the United States Army, when I was liberated by the American Army, and when I served as a soldier during the Korean War, after I finished Purdue, the Korean War was on, and there was a, they called it, they, they called it the Small War, Police Action Boy, Korea, but actually, it was, was 59,000 Americans died. It was a big kind of bloody battle. We, we, America and South Korea fight for North Korea and the Chinese. China of today was a big allies of the North Koreans. And anyway, even It's very difficult to describe. During World War II, in concentration camps, I wore Alcatraz uniforms, stripes uniforms. That's what that was our clothing was. Prisoners got beaten up all the time. But when I was liberated, and then after I finished Purdue, I was drafted in the United States Army. And, and it, it, you can't put it into words. The fact that in concentration rooms I wore Alcatraz uniforms, and now I was a soldier in the United States Army, first PFC, and I reached the rank of corporal. I was very proud that I made corporal, two stripes. That's as high as I've ever achieved. I mean, General Douglas MacArthur made five stars. But I had two stripes, and that was a corporal. I was, was very proud of my military rank. But the point is, when you liberated by the American army, 
and you live in America, I consider it an honor that I was drafted to the United States Army as a real soldier during the Korean War, and I served two years. I served one year at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and I also served six months in Presidio of Monterey, California. It was a language school. I studied Chinese. But it, it, was a, it was only a year's course, and the, they wanted me to re-enlist in order to complete the course. I said, no, I'll just take whatever the army gives me in two years, because at that time I was, it's after I finished Purdue, and, and I wanted to get home, because they, that was the season there was no television to speak up, no computers, you know. I, I, for, I never knew what a Purdue won or lost. So I said to myself, I'll finish my two years and then, then I'll go back in Indiana because I, I want to follow the Boilermakers so much I didn't want to enlist in the Army. <laughs> so, because in the Army at the time, the, I remember I was stationed in Monterey, California, and was, uh, once in a while there was a newspaper in the sport page saying Big Ten scores or anything. And, and there, was, there was no television or nothing. I, I wouldn't know whether my boilermakers won or lost. So I said, no, I'll just, I told the Army, you, you send me to this language school, I'll study Chinese, but I'll do all my service in the military for the two years for which I was drafted. So I, uh, at that time, yes, I had my artillery, I was an artillery man, which I learned at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, 105 howitzers. They said, well, you'll have to go to the Far East. I said, well, many people have gone before me. That's when I had it, ostensibly, you go to Korea. But when you go to Korea, the map, you go through Japan, that's what the map, the map looks like. You go to Korea, you go through Japan. And in Japan, I, it, it was 1953, the Korean War started to lose some of its intensity. So they didn't live, need any more artillery forces, 105 howitzers for which I was trained. And they told me, they called me in, they said, they called me by my official name, Mike. Very few people called me Mike. Only the, the people, in the, the officers and the sergeants called me Mike. But all, everybody else called me Mickey. They said, we don't need any more artillery forces, but we notice, going through your records, that you're... Hmm. Uh, going to, uh, uh, they said, you, uh, you have a degree from Purdue, we, you're a pharmacist, registered pharmacist in Indiana, we need a pharmacist right here in Japan, they said. It was called the Osaka Army Hospital, it used to be a Japanese hospital. Osaka is, is if Tokyo is like New York, Osaka is like Chicago or Los Angeles. Osaka is the second largest city in Japan. And I was stationed in the city of Osaka for a whole year. And when I was stationed in Osaka, I had a very interesting experience. The friendship and laughter in establishing friends every place in the world. And one time in a pharmacy in Japan, Osaka, Japan, my co-workers were Japanese citizens. And this one young lady, a Japanese, she spoke a little English, she was one of my co-workers, so to speak. Right here in America, we call it the pharmacy tech. You know, pharmacy tech. And one time it was kind of quiet, and she says, I said, Mickey, are you in, are you, are you, are you an American? I said, yeah. She says, 
Then she asks, she says, she says, how come you're so short? Most all Americans that work they're in the army are much taller than you. I said, some fire. I said, and that's hit the code of friendship because the Japanese at the time were also short. The genealogy, they were not, not too many of Japanese made it in a big turn, quoted or, or drafted by Bobby Knight or, or Gene Cady because we were all short. Japanese were all short too. So I said, why did you ask whether I'm American or not? And this Japanese girl was working with me. We were all the same status. I was in charge of the pharmacy, but we were just all friends. We didn't, I didn't use my, my status as a pharmacist in charge. That was, that was not important. And she, she said, well, you, are, you, are, you captured Japan. You are bosses. And I'm we're taller than you are. And we produced a nice laugh. And when I was in Japan, by the way, I we took a trip to Hiroshima. I saw Hiroshima. Zero point of when the atomic bomb hit this lived untouched. And at that time in nineteen fifty three it was it was these flowers, a little garden. And I know if, if I, I don't want to interject politics, but the, the, the atomic bomb, which was courageously ordered by President Harry Truman, saved thousands and thousands of Americans as well as Japanese citizens. But I happened to visit Hiroshima, the city of Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. Nagasaki was the second atomic bomb recipient. I didn't see Nagasaki in person, only from a troop train, from a train, train station. But I always believed, I, to this day, the decision to drop the atomic bomb saved hundreds of thousands of human beings, soldiers and civilians alike. When I came in, when I concluded my, my, my military career, I want to tell you how I met my wife, Eva. People usually who, are, who happen to be with a Jewish background, we always got kicked around all over the world for his, in history. We never had a homeland. We always lived in someone else's land. This was a hate and anti-Semitism was so prevalent. But now Israel was a country among countries with its own military, with its own House of Representatives, Congress, so to speak, legislative department. It was a country among countries. And regardless of what a political view a person has, Israel was in the midst, in the Middle East, of enemies. The so-called neighbors didn't want Israel to have a, a homeland. Their main mission was to shove the Jews into the Mediterranean Sea. But I'll be honest with you, most Jews couldn't swim that well. Therefore, that was not a viable option. <laughs> So that's where they formed the old military, and it's the first time in history where they, they didn't have to live at the mercy of anybody else in this world. They had their own country. They had embassies all over the world. They were countries among countries. So when a person of the Jewish religion or nationality had enough money, I was a pharmacist at the time. I wasn't rich, but I had a nice job and I earned enough money. So Jewish people usually, when you go on vacation, especially when you're single, when you go on vacation, you don't go to, to they call it the sandals on television, you know, these, um, these beautiful vacation spots, they call it the sandals. I had no yearning to see 
sandals and sand. I wanted to see the Jewish homeland because I suffer so much for being homeless and everybody wants to spit on you, spit on you. Now we have our own country. And, and I, I, I got a ticket and I arrived in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv I had, I, I had a brother and I, yeah, I had a family there already. My brother went through the same background as I did. Only he settled in Israel, he got married, and, and when I uh, visited him, they had three, three little children, three junior high school kids, when I visited him. And I'll never forget it. They said, oh, ever, all the kids, uh, my brothers, his wife, children, they said, Uncle Mickey just came from Israel, for, from America to Israel. And all the hugs and kisses and hugs, kisses. But it was very sad, I remember, I was on vacation there. And when the page in a passport, I think it's called visa, the stamp, the stamp says you gotta leave, you gotta go. And then it's funny human nature. The happy moments when you arrived in Israel with my nephews and nieces, three, I forgot, two, two girls and a boy, I think it was two boys, I think two boys and a girl, two girls and a boy, there was the three children, junior high school age, and, it's, and said, oh, Uncle Mickey just came, and everybody was laughed, and we all had a good time. But when the time was to leave, as I mentioned, when the visa says, your vacation is up, it's sadness, it's funny in life, Sad, psychological, psychological feeling of sadness is so much more powerful than the, the happiness of laughter and happy moments. Sadness for some reason, it's, it shouldn't be that way, but sadness is more powerful than happy, joyous moments. And I'll never forget this. And as a matter of fact, I visit my family, my brother's family, two or three times. But then I, I stopped because the, the goodbyes, the saying goodbyes, were very, were very painful to the little kids, and to my little nephews and nieces. But in one of those, the trip to Israel, I was introduced to Eva, my future wife, Eva Kaur. She was a soldier in the Israeli army herself. She was a draftsman by profession at the time as a civilian. But now she was in the Corps of Engineers, combat engineers. And we fell in love. We got married. And I brought her to Terre Haute. Now that's kind of funny. When I brought her, when I brought her to America, I tried to think of all aspects of American life that would make it more comfortable to live in America. But one thing which I did not mention to her was Halloween. Yeah, Halloween. Because I, I didn't think it was important. But when, she, when I remember we had a little house, a little bit of big, at that time, little houses with picture windows was a big deal, I remember this. And the first Halloween, when we, we ourselves had two children too. And, and, and the Halloween custom, of course, is when they mess up the windows and the cars and the windows of our little picture window, you know what I mean? Halloween holiday, they call it Halloween, it's a, Anyway, and messed up the windows, the car. And to us, those who are survivors of the Holocaust, these things are memories of, of torturous treatment. And, and it brings back Nazi life or something. And I remember Eva got real mad to the kids who, who kept messing around with our windows, both in the car 
and in the house itself. And 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 the school was was my two children went. They even used a dirty word, so to speak. They said, "You dirty Jew! You, your mom that didn't give us any candy, even didn't give us any trick or treats." Well, I didn't breathe my I didn't breathe either, but life on the Halloween, I just forgot to tell her about it. So we didn't even give him candy, and this created some tremendous of hate for us. And they invoked this, this sad expression, Jody Jew. It was very painful to us when they did it. But it's funny, life is always funny. Eva is now very active in the community, and she always, she speaks all over the world, she speaks all over the United States. So she's rather well known. She had her stories are written up in the newspapers. And one day, or quite often when she goes shopping, those very same people, little kids, fellow students, who messed up our windows, our windows, and, and, and yelled at us for not giving up candy. Now they're lawyers and doctors and dentists and professors. And they would introduce themselves to Eva at Kroger's, at Kroger's uh, store, grocery store, and say, Mrs. Gore, I'd like to apologize. I was one of the little guys who messed up your windows and you got mad at us. And they, they were invoked by the American spirit. They said, I'd like to apologize. It's a pleasure to meet you at a more happier occasion. And they happened to be, a, this a fellow was a dentist, I think, I remember. But it, the fact that I didn't introduce Eva to Halloween, yeah, I, I, I just, I know it's just a holiday of folklore. I didn't consider it such a big event. But it was a mistake on my part. Because it's the first time where, where young kids called my kids dirty Jew. My kids didn't tell me that incident because it was been very painful to me. But I worked in drugstores all the time, and I, uh, a lot of times I worked from morning, early in the morning to late at night. Uh, I, people in pharmacies back 50 years ago, we didn't have unions or some other legal entities to regulate your hours. So I just, as a, as a pharmacist, in the early years of my life, I worked all the time. For example, my son Alex, he never made it in high school because he wasn't tall enough, but he was a star player in the church league in the Williams, in the YMCA. And in boys club as well, boys club. Remember the boys club? And, the and my son Alex would say, Dad, you're gonna see me play next Tuesday? I said, well, Alex, I know, but if life is any, any indication, I better work that Tuesday. And if I, I would never consider it to ask my boss to let me off to go to see a basketball game for my son. I considered this weakness. I, I just never, so I missed a lot of my, children's sports activities because of the nature of my job. But that's it, I chose a profession that works all the time. Now, of course, in modern society, pharmacists is governed by, as it's called, unions or some other, they've worked so many hours. And that's it. But I, my, uh, my early years, or the long part, I worked in drugstores. But I worked all the time, <laughs> and whenever my sons had a basketball game, I knew I, I missed it, and it was quite painful to me. And the, on a more serious issue, when I saw a, I want to see a college game, I missed it because I was working out. But I was trained from an early age in life. Working on a job is the most important thing. The thing that to which you earn money 
to participate in the American success story. You work whatever the schedule says you work. And I didn't, I, I said, I was trained by my old philosophy that, that you work what the schedule calls for. If for your job, you pick the profession that you work all the time. That's it. That's, that's, that's part of life. It may not sound important, but my, I, remember we, I made up for it. For my son Alex, my ping pong background, gravitated me into tennis. And we played tennis quite often together. And my son Alex was fortunate enough to get a, got a scholarship at Butler University. And then there was a nice little incident. I want to tell you about it. When he applied to Butler University for a scholarship, he also applied one for some reason for UNLV, because for some reason UNLV was very famous in America because of its basketball phenomenon. I said, Alex, don't, don't, consider, don't consider UNLV. If Butler gave you a scholarship, please go to Butler. And this is really interesting. When he, when he was given the scholarship at Butler University, as a student and player of the basketball, of the sports program at Butler. The lady at the office, in the, in the administrator's office, athletic, athletic director's office, sent us a, a letter, a registered letter. And a registered letter has several stamps, you know, United States Post Office stamps, you know. And then in the corner of one of the envelopes, the lady in the office, the lady in the, in the office as secretary to the athletic director, she says, congratulations for becoming a bulldog. I thought it was a very proud envelope because Alex was not a six foot eight guy who would ever mature into a basketball star or, 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 or an end on the offensive part of a football team, because kinesiology, as they say, being my son, they would never be six-eight. But now the official member for the NCAA team, Butler, happy to battle basketball team, and the lady in the office sent among the stamps of the official envelope saying that you've been accepted with a scholarship and she made it a registered letter. And in the corner she said, congratulations for becoming a bulldog. That's the same honor bestowed to, to a member of the Division I basketball team. It meant a lot to us. I ran into that envelope. As old as I am, I'm beginning to go through a lot of my envelopes and a memorial uh, memories memories in form of letters and papers and and I'm beginning to throw away because I happen to be eighty five years old and I always um, mention it to my friends when I lecture when I emphasize that I have, I'm eighty five years old and I use a metaphor of sports. And I say to my audience, when I speak to them, I say, if life is like a basketball game, I'm in my second overtime. I realize that a light bulb, it's always have light bulbs in that name in the gym, 15 seconds of, I don't have many light bulbs left. I'm realistic. But my biggest, my, my proudest moments is when I made the choice to go to Purdue for several, say, athletics 
good scientific curricula, and then they had a, and they had a a stamp of excellence. When you go to Purdue, the worldwide, it's, it's almost analogous to MIT or some of the other big schools in the East Coast that people always talk about. And, and my pride, my pride in, in, in seeing the athletic, we, we won some good games. We never made it to the NCAA finals. We made it to the Sweet 16. We, we won an NIT tournament once in 75, I think it was. But NIT is not, does not have the pride as an NCAA tournament does. And looking back now, I, I, I'm really glad that I became a Boilermaker. Because it's a well-rounded education, and it's well known all around the world. I found out about it, but I was a soldier in Japan, and you strike up a conversation with someone. They say, in civilian life, I went to Purdue, and a Japanese human being, a citizen, who speaks a little bit English, they say, "Oh yeah, we heard of it." I felt good inside of me that I made the part of the right choice. How much more time have I got? Whenever you're ready, Mickey, tell me. I, I want to tell you about an incident when I met uh, Johnny Wooden, Coach Wooden. When I finished high school in Terre Haute, I went to Lap School. Lap School was affectionately known as school. It's a high school which is jointly owned or administered by the Terre Haute School Corporation and Indiana State. It's called Lap School, affectionately known as Lap School, because Indiana State was just a small little teacher's college known Indiana State Teacher's College. Its athletic teams were not even part of the NCAA system. It was NAIB, I think you forgot. ISTC, the Indiana State Teacher's College. It didn't. It didn't even belong to the to the NCAA. I think they had a different classification. But anyway, we had. I had to wait my turn because all the GIs had. They had rightfully so. The veterans who just came back from the wars all over the world. They came back from the war from the wars in to out. They had the privilege. We we had to wait. We those of us who did not serve. We had to wait for our turn. So instead, I went to IS, I went to lab school because the, the teachers in Terre Haute felt that I should go to a school which specialized more in English teaching because I, I, I spoke some English, but I, I didn't speak it perfectly well because I came from a foreign country. So lab school was just right. But it had all, it had all the privileges of regular high school. And I'll never forget it, my gym teacher, my gym teacher was ISTC, Indiana State Teachers College. It's a college, but a very small teacher's college. It's not the big university which it is now. And it had, it had the numbers, the education always had numbers. And when I found out that John Wooden was my teacher in gym, physical education course number 149, I'll never forget this. And when, when I graduated from Purdue, as a matter of fact, when I graduated with my own education, I always thought about John Wooden because by that time he had won, at the conclusion of his career, he had won 12 NCAA championships at UCLA. And one day I decided to write him a letter. 
I'll never forget this. It was so long ago. They didn't have any zip codes. So I wrote a letter. Coach John Gooden, UCLA, Los Angeles, California. No zip code because there were no zip codes. And I'll never forget, I wrote the letter to him. I said, Coach Wooden, my name is Mickey Core. You may not remember this, remember me, but I was the shortest student in your PE 141 at ISTC, the smoke. And time went by, I never expected a reply because he was busy, he's now a famous individual who won 12 NCAA championships. And when he finished, was going to the White House and Johnny Carson, and every, Johnny Carson was a famous TV per, personality on the Today Show, you know what I mean? Not Today Show, Tonight Show, rather. And then I, I got a reply from him. I said, Mickey, hi Mickey, he said, Yes, I remember you, you're a short guy. And he was my gym teacher. And I also mentioned to him that sometimes you have a few minutes before class, in gym class, he would teach us how to make jump shots. Famous Johnny Wooden, who had Kareem Abdul Jabbar, as he was a f superstar at UCLA. Wasn't that his name? You had people like that, uh, his students. Now you had Mickey Core teaching him to make jump shots. Do you get the analogy? And then I remember when he died recently, at age 94, I wrote a letter to the editor and they published it because he was such an honorable man. I spoke. He was an English teacher in South Bend, Indiana, or someplace in the northern part of the state. So there was another. There was another human in sports that I met. And, and, and John Wooden, the famous John Wooden, was my gym teacher at ISTC. It's uh, Indiana State. It's, I had to wait before there was room to go to Purdue, say, because the, the most veterans it just came out from all the wars we had. I'm talking World War II now. And, and they had to wait till they fulfilled their code now, but there's a word. And they, all the GIs, they had a GI bill, they called it, I think. And we, I had to wait till all the former soldiers were placed in universities. Then they took those of us who never went to, in the military. But then I went on, after I finished Purdue, I was a soldier myself. By that time I had my degrees already. And one of my proudest moments, my, one of my proudest, proudest moments was three, three proudest moments when I got married to a, a young lady from Israel, had two children, and the fact that the world, in fact, that I was a prisoner in concentration camps, and I wore the, the Nazi stripes the concentration camps, and I never knew where I would live. For, for four years I was a prisoner, and I never knew where I'd see daylight the next day. I mean, I, I, I never forget the time, for example, one time in, in one, in a, in a camp, I was in a camp, and I didn't even talk to the guard. I didn't even pay attention to him. But he popped it in, he says, he says, I don't like Jews. I don't like Jews. And it kind of burned me up inside. I, but I knew I was going to be dead anyway, so, what, so, so I said a little quietly so he wouldn't hear me. I, uh, he says, I, I spoke German. I, most of us spoke German. And I said it in German. He says, I hate Jews. And I said real quietly, like, so he wouldn't hear me, but I heard it, my conscience heard it. I said, I'm not the crazy about you either. I told him that, but I said it kind of quietly. Because, you see, let's say it was a Tuesday when this conversation took place. Well, you may be around Thursday, or you may not be around Thursday, 
but you surely are not going to be out next week. We always knew that 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 the chances are of f f living a week. Everything was based on the fact that we were destined to be killed. And, and most of my fellow Jewish people were murdered. Six million of us were killed. But on every, I, he says, I, I hate Jews, the guy says. And I said a little quietly, can I throw me off a little bit? I said, I'm not too crazy about you either, but he didn't hear me. Because if he heard me, he'd beat me up to a pulp thing. But I did say it, but I said it quietly, but inside of me it sounded like a noise, like, like a choir, a field house full of people. Because we like we like the field house principle of basketball games. So I always, but I, I told him, I said, I'm not too crazy about you either. I told him that. But, but ten seven, he didn't say anything, he didn't hear me. But um, uh, then I want to tell you about my piano playing. When I finished at Purdue, I lived in Kelly Hall. It's a, it's a nice residence hall, and it has a lot of laboratories, of course, at the university. But at Kelly Hall, they had a, a, a nice lounge, a dining room, dining hall. And then you had a little lounge where students could uh, have uh, have a coke and just relax. And in the dining, it was a lounge, I guess you call it. And there were pianos there. And I, I, I learned how to play piano at Purdue as well as when I was a soldier in the United States Army. Same principle. United States Army, we were always busy, you know, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. That's where you have basic training, you constantly start military efforts. But um, the American civ the civilian entities of the American society used to have, um, I can't think, it's a, it's a special social entity club where where they have a club where you have coffee and donuts and and, and there also there was a piano. And over this, this relaxing atmosphere, coffee, donuts, I remember, and Americans, native, uh, uh, pretty girls, American girls would, uh, would, would serve us with coke and drum. But I forgot what they called the it's a civilian club financed by American uh, philanthropy, people who, with money, would build these ent entities, you know, you know what I mean? And that's why I learned how to play. I can read notes, but I play by, by, by ear. And it's funny, being 85 as old as I am, I forget a lot of names and, and entities and, and events in my life. But I also am beginning to forget the notes of my piano planes. You know what I mean? So I play, when I finish a lecture, I donated the little piano myself. It wasn't that expensive, it's a used piano. The, the museum doesn't support it, I, I paid for it personally. So when I finish the lecture, I play only four or five songs. I play Nat King Cole. You heard of Nat King Cole? I play Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole. And then I play a Latin song his name was David Cougar. He was an American, Cuban, Latin artist. He was popular at MGM. Metro Goldwyn Mayer was one of the famous Technicolor motion picture studios. 
I suppose you're old enough to remember that because you just about you got that age. Uh, MGM and he made some MGM movies. So when I play my piano, I play only four or five songs. The less, the less I, the less I play, the less mistakes I make. You know, because I can read notes. When when I start playing napkin curl or uh, I play Frank Sinatra's. Uh, signature piece that he became famous more because he was he was called uh, autumn autumn leaves yeah autumn leaves but I uh, sometimes I hit the wrong key and it, it sounds like autumn in Vermont it's a different song by the way but I play uh, Frank Sinatra Nat King Cole Xavier Cougar that gave us the Latin beat. And then the last six months or so, the last year now almost, I learned how to play a song which is more important than any of the other songs that I ever studied. It's called God Bless America because it's a country that gave me a home with a mission to be a citizen of the United States. So I play. God bless America. And then I had a pleasant experience right here. One of my guests, or several guests, there was a whole group of ladies. Is they call them the redheads, red redheads. Those are ladies who are they 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 are they are not extremely rich people, but they are they have enough resources in life. They spend their time going around museums and cultural background stories of, a, of the American way, American life. And they're called the Red Hats, the ladies with the Red Hats. And I didn't know anything about them. All I know is that I prayed, God bless America. And there were 12 of them, just elderly ladies, and they all stood up and they sang this beautifully this song. God bless America. This just this it shook me up, as they say. And then they told me what their mission is. They they have enough money. T they don't have to work anymore. They're adults, retired adults, and they travel from one museum to another. As a matter of fact, after they finish with our museum. They went to Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois, I think it is. So that gave me a nice feeling. See, people don't realize that of all the countries in the world, America is the best there is. And even though part of democracy Part of the First Amendment, you can yell, everybody can yell and talk against against America, this or that. But take it from someone who lived under the Nazis, who wore striplings, Alcatraz uniforms, who didn't know whether he would be alive or dead tomorrow or the weekend, and live in such a great country like America. That's the reason I always conclude my concert my rendition will last only five or ten minutes because the less I play as I mentioned the less mistakes I make I always wind up with playing God bless America that tells my story I'm proud of, a, of an American citizen and I'm proud of being an alumnus of Purdue University and this will conclude my show Should I conclude with a piano song? I'll give it to you right now. I'll, I'll start with, with Frank Sinatra. And I'll, I'll play those four songs I told you about right now. I'll start out with All the Leaves by Frank Sinatra. But keep in mind that it's all based on memory because I can't read really notes and I'm forgetting so yet My memory doesn't do me much justice anymore. Thank you. 